congratulations on your government assignment. I know that all of you are being sent back to the Victorian era, and my job today is to describe what a typical ladies' day would be like in the Victorian era. Sorry, I have an itchy nose. Um, I know that some of you are going back in time as ladies, some of you are going back in time as governesses, and some of you will be going back in time as ladies' maids. I know you will all be sent to large, fine houses, so learning about the Victorian morning routine and the beauty routine and how they used cosmetics, if any at all, will help you, even you who are ladies' maid. I'm so sorry, I have my hair on my nose. Anyway, I know you are also, I read the brief and you're being sent back to three different periods in the Victorian time, the 1850s, the 1870s, and the 1890s. And so what we talk about today will span the time frame of the Victorian era because we're going to learn what kind of cosmetics and what kind of a beauty routine those women followed. We will learn a little bit about fashion of the era, but that changed continually and it changed a lot between the 1850s and the 1870s and then between the 1870s and the 1890s. Um, so I won't be able to talk in depth, too much in depth about fashion. We'll have to do that at another time. Those of you who are going back at ladies, as ladies' maids will really need to learn how to do some of the very elaborate hairstyles that were done during this time. So let's go ahead and get started with the typical morning routine. If you want to follow me up these stairs, if, as a Victorian lady, you would be getting up around 7.30 as a maid. And here, this maid is very bad. She doesn't even have her shoes on. You would be getting up much earlier than that to set the fires and bring up tea or breakfast or whatnot. And one of the first things you'll do as a maid in the Victorian era is close the windows. Victorians were very concerned with the gas is that they thought built up in people's rooms overnight, so you had your window open. And then as a lady, you might enjoy a cup of tea or breakfast in bed before going down. At night, you would wear a typical cotton nightgown. We will be sending you back in time with these. And then you're gonna switch this out in the daytime for a chemise and a pair of bloomers, which you're going to wear under a petticoat. Now, you might wear many sets of petticoats, up to 11. Here I'm demonstrating a chemise, a bloomer, and a corset. Now, my corset is ill-fitting, and I can't ever seem to find one online that suits, but we will be having you, your corsets custom made. They're um, fairly expensive. Here's a look at some custom made corsets. They're absolutely beautiful. And I just wanted to give you a better look at what what your undergarment situation might look like. Your plumers will probably be shorter than this. And over these you will of course wear the petticoats. And depending on your time period, you may wear anywhere from 1 to 11 pairs of, or 11 petticoats. I guess that's not pairs of petticoats. As a Victorian lady, your beauty routine would call for five minutes of hair brushing every day, in the morning and in the evening. And yes, you'd be doing this at the same time as you're washing up with your wash basin. You'll also be putting on a pair of stockings. But I want to talk about the fact that um, there is no running water in most people's homes until about the 1890s. So those of you going back to the 1850s and 1870s will probably not experience a house with any running water. I'd like to digress a little bit and tell you about the impediment 
impetus for running water and improved sanitation in homes that came about from the absolutely horrible and fetid conditions of the 1850s. You see, I read that the situation was particularly acute in London and other cities in Britain. The summer of 1858 in particular represented a pivotal movement in the move towards modern plumbing. Hot weather exacerbated the smell of untreated sewage in the river, bringing the city to a standstill. The government could barely function, and people avoided leaving their homes. Urgent action was needed. The force of sheer stench prompted the government to accept Joseph Belt's Getz proposal of a modern sewer network, of which you will be the beneficiary if you are going after to London after 1858. Those of you going to London before that period, I apologize in advance. Because you do not have running water and because you are all going to be very modest women of the time, you're going to discreetly use your basin of water in your own room for cleaning up. Now, they were getting running water and improved sanitation in their homes at this time. But the modest woman still did not take a lot of baths because modesty and women's bodies were all tied up together and the modest woman could not be seen revealing very much of her skin. So if you were a modest woman, taking a bath could be risky. You might have to walk past a servant the servant might see a part of you that they shouldn't see. Um, so the wash basin was much more discreet. And some of the popular washes that were used at that time were water and rosemary. So you might see um, others putting rosemary in the wash basin. Still others used, now these would just be wealthy women because obviously servants couldn't afford not sure if you can see that very well. I need to film it. They would use lemons, strawberries in their water if they could get them. What else would they use? Sometimes they had alcohol in the water to give them more of an astringent effect. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and we'll wash. They would wash all the parts that needed washing, but because we're going to be very modest, I'll just wash your face today, okay? So if I can just go ahead. Just gonna go ahead and wipe your beautiful face. How does that feel? So yeah, this is basically their beauty routine. They would not have used a lot of cosmetics at this time, but we will talk about some of the cosmetics you may see people using at this time, but usually it was just going to be a sponge bath and a wash basin might have been their entire routine. And then in addition, they would have done these, what, uh, what we consider to be fairly elaborate hairstyles with lots of braids, maybe braids that go down and around their bun. First and foremost, a woman in Victorian and for Victorian era was expected to be modest. And so it's said that Queen Victoria found cosmetics vulgar, and for most women in the age, they did not use makeup. Now we're talking about Victorian England. If we talk about America in the colonial times and in the 1800s, they used even less makeup. Uh, it wasn't something they could get their hands on, for one. So yeah, Victoria has kind of set the tone by people, by saying that she thought using makeup was impolite. However, we do know some from her diaries 
and she wrote that she found some people looked better when they wore rouge and going with that. So there was this kind of a conflict between the modest woman who didn't use makeup and the fact that most women wanted to use some kind of beauty product, just like modern women, to improve how they looked. So what we have happening in the Victorian era, the height of what a beautiful woman would look like is something we call tuberculosis chic. People felt that the pale color and dilated eyes of tuberculosis victims were beautiful and they sought to recreate the look. And that may seem a little bit strange, but at that time, beauty and, and being the fragile upper-class lady went together. So as we know, for the most part, people did not use cosmetics and beauty products. Although we see towards the end of the Victorian era, more beauty products becoming mass-produced. And we even see a few beauty products that were being mass-produced even before Victoria came to the throne. And we'll, we'll talk about those in a bit. So I want to start with something simple, you know, like the wash basins, and how this is how women would clean themselves every day. Now, if you cleaned all your parts every day with this, very clean and you would not need to have a bath very often and so yeah Victorians didn't take baths very often maybe you know for the man of the house maybe he was bathing once a week and women less than that Victoria was known to use water with elderberry flowers in it and she would use that to wash up every evening. I'm not sure if she also used that in the morning. So another thing that Victoria would do is she would use chamomile tea on her eyes. Again, this was something that she was using in the evenings. But I'm just going to go ahead and do this. She would have um, just rags that would be reused and she would put them on her eyes. But I'm just going to dab this on. and soothing and then she would leave them on there for a while. But I'm just going to go ahead and, and tap this lightly. Now, at this time, commercial soaps were just getting started, more towards the latter Victorian era. But we do see a company called Pears, which is still around, still making soap. The Victorians also had something called carbonic soap, which was mildly antiseptic which was very important in the Middle Age because uh, the Middle Age, the Victorian age. I'm sorry, I also have a group of people going back to the Middle Ages. But in the Victorian age, they were just starting to understand the association between germs and dirtiness and infections. So having this soap, they did realize that it was helping to keep down infection. So, like I said, many women would add alcohol to their water and there was even some enterprising companies at this time which made an astringent. Dr. Dayers has been around since 1947 and this is an astringent made out of witch hazel and rose petals. Anything rose-scented was incredibly popular. I'm going to go ahead and use some of this on you. And this would have been something that only very wealthy ladies could afford. And so yeah, this is just a bit of witch hazel that I'm going to put on you and rose flower water to just help really cleanse your skin. So after bathing, a woman might use a powder puff and some perfume talc on all the places that she had just washed. I'm not going to do that, even though I love the idea of using a big fluffy um, powder puff to put on talcum powder. I think that would feel so nice. But I know that we now 
have questions about how safe talcum powder is to use, and it has been linked to cancer. So a word of warning, word of warning, if you go back in time, you may want to try to stay away from the talcum powder. So that brings us to the next point. Victorians used a lot of unsafe products in their cosmetics. Things like lead, arsenic. Um, for instance, we know that they used lead-based powders, especially in the early 1800s, and that was a holdover from the Georgian period. Now, because they wanted that tuberculosis chic, they would try to lighten their faces using the white lead. I'm going to send you back in time with some zinc oxide based powder. And you can also, I think, zinc oxide powders were starting to be used at this point in time. So, can I just go, well, you know what? I'm not gonna put this on you because we are gonna do, we're gonna use cold cream Cold cream is the second part of a beauty routine in the Victorian era. Another thing that Victorians really liked about the tuberculosis look, the tuberculosis sheet, was the way the eyes were dilated. And they thought that that was very beautiful. So again, it gave a woman kind of that wide-eyed look. And they would put drops of belladonna in their eyes. This is incredibly dangerous and something that we will, of course, not be doing. We will try to achieve something like that by using eye drops. And these eye drops are not meant to be used at to dilate like eyes. They'll just give it a glossy, watery look, which was also part of the tuberculosis chic look. Could you come a little bit closer so I can put this in your eye? That's it. Just a little bit. There we go. Yeah, and we'll just will make your, it look like you, you know, you're a little bit, you've got that glossy kind of watery eye that they would have found chic at that time. Incidentally, I have a condition called Ehlers Danlos, which causes my eyes to be constantly dilated. So at that point of time, I would have looked very chic from that standpoint because that's what they were going for. Um, I constantly have adrenaline pumping through my system, so my eyes are always dilated. And people have actually come out here and said, why do you always look scared? And I thought, oh, I'm not scared to make a video, but it is because my eyes are always dilated. I always hated that about my eyes, but darn, maybe if I went back into Victorian time, my dear friend, I would be fashionable. The main point of the beauty routine in Victorian England was to, since they didn't use cosmetics to cover up any blemishes or freckles, it was incredibly important to do your skin care right so you wouldn't get a lot of blemishes and you wouldn't get a lot of freckles. Freckles, I don't know why, because freckles are so adorable. But Victorians were terrified of freckles, so make sure that you wear your bonnet when you go outside. Freckles were much maligned. Um, I read this book, and I can't remember the title of it, but I'm going to quote the author, and I will put her name and the book's name in the commentary section but down below. But she wrote that women employed a great many methods to keep their skin soft, smooth, and blemish-free. From the most basic soap and water routine to iodine facials. I have no idea what an iodine facial, but that obviously that I need to look that up. That was something that they were doing in the 19th century. And they had other kind of facials. And all forms of cosmetics that reached the height of quackery were employed at this time. The Victorians were becoming wealthier and they could go out and they could buy basically these snake oil um, cosmetics that people were selling that would cure anything. And they were desperate to get rid of their blemishes and their freckles. 
Um, the reason why is that Big Victorians believed that a woman's complexion, my dear friend, was a direct result of lifestyle and state of mind. So if you showed up with blemishes, then obviously you were of bad humor. It wasn't your DNA, it was you, you just weren't happy enough. According to the 1849 issue of the Water Cure Journal, and let me just go ahead and why I talk, just wipe a little bit more. The best way of securing a good complexion. To lay in a stock of good health and good humor, and right? good health and good temper. And they went on to write, we know of no cosmetic equal to the sunny smile. It gives the grace of beauty to the swarthy hue and makes even freckles Horrible because freckles are just so adorable, and and we know now that they're genetic. So, Victorians also believed that any kind of excess was harmful to the skin. As the 1841 handbook of the toilette explains, goodness of complexion, whether the skin be fair or brown is incompatible with excess of bodily or mental labor. An excess of pleasure or dissipation. And the unfortunate thing about all this was, unfortunately, these ideas meant that if one did have blemishes or freckles, like I've said, then they were blamed for this. There was obviously something that was wrong with their disposition. Right? So, if only if all you ladies will smile, then I'm sure you'll have a completely clear complexion. Of course, the Victorians had no way of knowing that blemishes and freckles were related to our DNA. So science was, of course, not there at that point. So I just wipe your forehead gently, gently, gently. So we should talk about the next part of the beauty routine. The next part would be the cold cream. And cold cream was huge in the Victorian era. So I'm just going to go ahead and wipe this on your face a little bit. The handbook of the toilet advises in the Victorian times that every morning the face and hands, can you come up a little bit closer so I can get this on your face, the face and the hands, and that part of the neck of ladies which is exposed, as well as the part of the arms, that were exposed to view were supposed to receive a portion of cold cream to be well rubbed in with a towel. So you'd put that on and then you would rub it in with a towel. Apparently there was not just one recipe for cold cream but many and here's a small video of me making this cold cream. So yeah, there are a lot of recipes for cold cream, but most of them called for things like lard or um, sperm whale fat. And this is one vegan recipe that I found from the 1800s for cold cream. Oil and it uses almond oil, white wax, and rose water as ingredients. 
so I gave it a try. That's cold cream in a nutshell, and I really do like how the cold cream came out. I think it feels really good on the skin, and I don't wipe it off, I just keep it on there. But I, of course, would not use it on my face, because I think the wax would just clog my pores. But, okay, so let's talk about eye makeup. There really wasn't any eye makeup used at this time. What we'll do for your makeup today is we'll just put a little bit of castor oil on. Okay, 
I just left a little dot. Just two little dots. I had to smear it around. Anyway, you wanted to just a very light application of it because you're going for the no makeup makeup look. The newspaper publications at this time in the early 1800s were quick to judge women. And they wrote that ruddy cheeks produced by liquid were comparable to ruddy cheeks produced by excessive drink. Again, there's that discord between what people believe and what was actually happen happening. Everybody still wanted to have the beautiful glowing cheeks, but of course they could, they could never admit that they were wearing rouge. Victorian women desperately wanted rouge and they were very inventive. They would make it out of anything they could get their hands on including strawberry juice, crushed geraniums, and rubbing their cheeks with red colored flannel. And that is a direct quote from the book that I read on the women in the Victorian era. And I, I kind of wondered what it would be like to rub your face with red colored flannel. I'll have to try that if I ever get some red colored flannel. And the same was true about lip rouge and lip zap. Ladies wanted it. They wanted that rosy hue to their lips, and they relied on lip rouge, which was light cheek rouge, rouge that was fairly easy to make at home in the 1840s and 1850s. Victorian ladies made red lip salve by using suet and lard boiled with alkanet chips to produce a deep red color. I am not 100% sure what alkanet is. Again, the bruise was never accepted by society. So the key was to add a bit of color, but not enough that anybody would call you out for, for using a cosmetic. So I'm just going to go ahead and apply it to your lips. Could you pluck her up? Like that. We'll just go ahead and use the same rouge color on our lips. And that, coupled with your elaborate hairstyle and your elaborate dress, would make you very fashionable. Just as long as nobody could really call you out and say that you, you were using these com cosmetics. Now, as I started to talk about earlier, fashion really changed over this time. In the 1850s, there were multiple petticoats and then finally the crinoline cage that women would wear to get the large skirt look. And then that went on to led to women wearing bustles. That changed to bustles in the 1870s and then to the reform movement of just straight skirts in the 1890s. So that concludes the makeup routine. And after being dressed and having makeup on, it's time for breakfast. A traditional breakfast might be some kind of porridge. And in the Victorian era, it was very fashionable to drink hot chocolate for breakfast. It might have also been eggs and bacon and the traditional fare. Um, but a Victorian breakfast was a social affair with everybody at the table. There's a lovely photo of Victoria and her family at breakfast together. Now I'm going to be sending you all back in, home tonight with some books to read that were popular in your time. For those of you going to the 1850s, there's a tale of two cities. For the 1870s, we have Far From the Madding Crowd. And for those of you going to the 1890s, we have Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. So after you washed up, you went to got dressed, you went to breakfast, and you came back, many Victorian women would do nail care, and we'll talk about that at a different time. They spent a lot of time working on their nails. And then after that, they might spend time going outdoors. Victorians felt that walking was very important to one's health. 
and on that point, they seem to have been correct. So, without further ado, I'm going to get up and go for a walk. Just follow me up these stairs as a Victorian lady. You would probably be expected to get up around 7.30. Well, here's a very bad maid because she doesn't have any shoes on. She's closing the window. Victorians slept with their windows wide open every night. And here's a maid bringing a cup of tea for the lady in the house. Now... Probably have just one or two simple. We'll be sending you back in time with some simple nightgown, just a plain anyway, white nightgown. And it's just a very light application. Just what you would be expected to have. And as the lady of the house, I might spend some time drinking tea in my bed, or I would get up and go downstairs to breakfast. Now, for those of you going back in time as ladies' maid. Produced by excessive drink. So, I don't lose my passion. Um, because you, you do not have running water, and, and because you are all going to be very modest women at the time, you're going to discreetly use your basin of water in your own room for cleaning up. Now, they were getting running water and improved sanitation in their homes at this time. But the modest woman still did not take a lot of baths because modesty and women's bodies were all tied up together and the modest woman could not be seen. you didn't have running water and really not much access to a bathtub for many reasons. Um, bathing was not something that a Victorian woman wanted to do a lot because, you know, if you lived in a fine home and you took a bath and you had to walk down the hall on the way back, um, that wasn't something a modest woman wanted.
I know you've all been assigned different roles in the Victorian era on your super secret government assignment. Some of you will be governesses, some of you will be lady maids, and others of you will be ladies. This video today is to talk about a normal ladies, middle class, upper class, Victorian routine. So for those of you who are ladies maids, it may not apply as well. Um, it also, I know that you're going back to different times in the Victoria era, Victorian era. Going back to Victorian era. I know some of you are going back to the 1850s and others of you are going to the 1870s and still others are going to the 1890s. So that's quite a, an expanse of time. It kind of covers the Victorian period comprehensively and we're gonna talk about a beauty routine that pretty much spanned those periods. Um, the dresses, however, changed drastically, and we'll talk more about that at another time. So the powers that be want me to explain to you what is expected of a woman in the Victorian era, especially when it comes to the beauty routine, the hygiene, what kind of cosmetics, if any at all, were being used. I've read the brief of your of what you need to know to go back in time, and I know you're being sent as everything from a servant to a fine lady, and I know that you are all heading for big houses, big country estates. So even if you're a maid, some of this will be useful so you can understand what is expected of you to help the lady of the house get ready in the morning. Time as ladies, and others of you will go back in time as ladies' maids. I also know that you're being sent to different times in Victorian England. Some of you will go back to the 1850s. Cosmetics were used very little in Victorian England. This beauty routine pretty much didn't change from 1850s to 1890s. Now, what did change and the way in which women were allowed to express themselves was fashion and hairstyles. And those are things that we will go over. We'll talk about briefly, but we'll go over them at another time. Really today, what we're gonna to concentrate on is how a woman would clean themselves at this point in time and what kind of cosmetics, if any, women did use to uh, express themselves from a beauty point of view. So if that sounds good, let's get started. Now, I want to show you a basically a woman's morning routine, what she would wear after she got up. Here I am wearing the basic undergarments of bloomers with some short sort of chemise. So the maid would come in in the morning, I would get up, I would trade my nightgown for the bloomers and chemise, and I'm, here I am also wearing a corset. We will have to order you a custom-made corset. This is just one I found online, and you can see it doesn't fit very well. But the custom-made corsets, which we will have made for you, are very beautiful, but they're quite costly. So yes, we will be sending you back in time with your own corset. In addition to what I would be wearing here, I would wear um, maybe one petticoat, maybe 11 petticoats in order to get the fullness of the skirt that was fashionable in the 1850s. In Victoria's time, 
women sometimes wore up to 11 pairs of undergarments, most notably petticoat skirt, in order to create that full skirt look that was fashionable between the 1850s and 1870s. We'll talk more about that after we talk about how a woman, a woman would wash up in the morning uh, during this period of time, because bathing was not, most houses didn't have running water, so the wash basin was really the way that most ladies and the servants, of course, would wash up during this period of time. And it is a myth that women were not very hygienic. You can wash, do a lot of washing with just a little bit of water. So they were hygienic and they were environmentally friendly at this time. Okay, so I know you are going to be a spy embedded. You're all going to be spies embedded with very wealthy families. And those of you who are going to the 1890s, some of you will live in families with running water, but most of you will not. This idea of running water was still relatively new. And if I might digress and, and talk about how the running water came about in Victorian England, I'd like you to, to tell you that the impetus for running water and improved sanitation in homes came about absolutely horrible and pathetic conditions of the 1850s. You see, at that time, all the human waste would basically go into the rivers or even sometimes into the streets. And so journals from that time period report that the situation was particularly acute in London and other cities in Britain. The summer of 1858 in particular represented a pivotal moment in the move towards modern plumbing. Hot weather, exacerbated the smell. Hot weather exacerbated the smell of untreated sewage in the river, bringing the city to a standstill. The government could barely function, and people avoided leaving their homes. So the problem of all this sewage in the streets and the rivers became a huge problem as anybody, as we can all understand. So urgent action was needed because the force of the sheer stench prompted the government to accept a comprehensive sewer system designed by a man named Joseph Balls Getz. And they adopted his proposal for a modern sewer network of which 1870s and 1890s will be beneficiaries. So you will arrive in a London that is not super stinky. 